What is the future? Well, the future, the future is right here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a city that makes history. This was the place where our forefathers founded this great nation. This is really an exciting project. It's going to provide housing for people who need housing. What could be better? It's wonderful. It's very much about regeneration. It's about youth. It's about employment. It's about innovation. It's about making things, that extraordinary, honorable tradition. Always looking to promote development and job creation in Philadelphia. This is a very exciting opportunity and a testament to our growth as a city. What happened to our properties was they took it and I think they stole it, really. My name is Barbara Lattimore. I'm married to Robert Lattimore. We've been married for 53 years now, but leading up to it, we were childhood sweethearts. When we did start dating and everything, we were young, but he always had a dream. And his dream was to become his own boss. And I wanted to do something in life because up to that point, it seemed like I was failing and everything. We had a mom and pop okay. store, grocery store. When, when he opened up the store, everything was going really well. He got into the real estate, he bought houses. Not all at one time now, we had to save hard. We sacrificed our life to get what we had. We acquired five properties down South Philly. We were satisfied, so he started working on them, renovating, building, you know, getting it all together. This is the corner store. Since we wasn't there, they started breaking in, broke windows. When they posted the um, condemnation papers on us, that's when the fight started. She was right on the money. She said, they're trying to take your property. I said, they can't take it. I own it. I own my property. They can't take my property. But because I never heard anything about eminent domain, they just came in. They gave me notice. You got X amount of days or uh, one month to get out. And guess how much they offered us for all of our properties? Oh, 73,000. Disgrace. Yeah. That's a disgrace. It just dawned on me later that they already had determine what they was going to do anyway. Now we have great-grandchildren. We have, what, 11 great-grandchildren, seven grandchildren. And it's so sad that we get this far and they have parties. And we don't have nothing to give them. We can't. We got nothing to offer. The only thing I have is the fight. I, I have to accomplish something. Now here I'm 72. I say, when am I going to enjoy life? Am I? The Lattimore story is a Philadelphia one. For decades, the city's emphasis on development has spawned new housing, more tourism, and greater attractions. 
There's no doubt this approach has helped Philadelphia. People have come back to the city. Depleted areas have been reborn. Philly is a center for growth and innovation, but we never look at the human toll of this change. So how has this investment, in not just the bricks and the mortar, but its people, transformed the city of brotherly love? To begin, we have to look back. The history of Philadelphia, like the history of any great city, is written in stone for anyone to read. Philadelphia has always been known as a city of homeowners. Every population had somehow built somewhere in the town. The Italians had a section, the Irish had a section, the Polish, the German, the blacks. So Philadelphia is, was a model for community. It was really the first big city in the U.S. You know, William Penn came, planned out all the squares and the streets. Philadelphia was the second biggest city in the British Empire after London for a very long time. So the history and the, the roots for the city and the people here run very deep. Philadelphians hope against hope. Amidst the chaos, leaders build grand projects and promise renewal. All of us working together. But on the streets, an undertow of violence, fear, and division threatens the spirit of the city. They're going to be when I look at Philadelphia and I look at which areas are underinvested and which areas have investment, uh, I always have to start with the, the history of redlining. It started in the era right after the Great Depression, when the federal government decided that it could encourage investment in the housing market as a way to jumpstart the economy and also create this sort of broad wealth for the U.S. Literal red lines were drawn on maps around neighborhoods um, marked declining, marked stable, and these were code words for explicitly what neighborhoods were becoming more black. They leave their house, go to they'd rather have a car than a nice house. If one house goes down, they all go down. A black person moves in the neighborhood, property value drops. <laughs> Plain and easy as that. <laughs> the federal government drew red lines around the black neighborhoods and said, we're not, we're not going to make loans in these neighborhoods. We're not going to insure loans in these neighborhoods. And we're going to tell banks that if you want government support, government incentives for loans, you cannot lend to these neighborhoods. So this was a federally institutionalized policy that explicitly led to racial segregation um, and removed from black households the main pathway through which American households have built wealth over the last century. Why are some areas poor and, one, and some areas aren't? I, I think back to redlining and I think that how the government intentionally created poor areas and cities and told people of color this is where you're going to live. So following World War II, the federal government and highway construction, you know, disinvestment in cities, uh, investment, private sector and public sector investment in suburban regions in the United States led to this mass suburbanization. People can escape from the crowded cities and move outward in search of open space to build their homes and raise their families. And it was a highly, you know, segregated racist form of population movement. It was represented by white flight. It was represented by white folks leaving cities um, and industries and work leaving cities and relocating in suburban regions. Once you created this like machine to create white suburban household wealth, it really, really worked. So in a city like Philadelphia, what happens is you know, there's this massive population loss. In the second half of the 20th century, Philadelphia loses about 25% of its population. And all over the city, especially in the primarily industrial parts of Fishtown and you know, the larger Kensington region, parts of South Philadelphia along the waterfront, uh, you see just abandonment of the old factory buildings and all places where people worked. And then you see this broader abandonment in communities and uh, uh, houses abandoned, torn down, empty lots, blight. In Philadelphia, uh, the real estate market really, uh, and the population loss and all the other problems that had been associated with the city 
um, for nearly half a century kind of bottomed out. So in the 80s and 90s, the city was at its worst in terms of neighborhood real estate markets. Depopulation was still happening, uh, housing vacancy was continuing, and so the, the primary problem was disinvestment. So this forces mayors and political leaders and political officials into, you know, thinking creatively. How do we attract businesses? How do we cut taxes to get businesses here? How do we get people back to a city? How do we save this? That's what's going to save these cities is the people. Ultimately, that, that kind of becomes these early stages of gentrification. Well, so gentrification is very narrowly defined as um, changes in incomes or changes in property values of a neighborhood, very sharp changes, um, as it goes from poor um, or to wealthier. So gentrification sounds polite and it sounds nice, but it really is institutional disruption. It is, it is cultural violence, right? Um, that uh, has taken place. The profit motive is what made uh, Society Hill click. The developers that went in there were able to get money because they could see money coming out of it. They'll come in and do all sorts of things. You know, they'll, they'll buy up the vacant homes for, the, for those that stayed. They'll offer them cash buyouts. You know, they'll cash purchases for their homes that, that may be way out of line with what the market value of the home might be. More money becomes invested in things to attract certain groups of people. But of course, who are we attracting? We're attracting middle class people. And all the while, there's folks that have lived in the cities like Philadelphia their whole lives and they have generations here. And there wasn't much attention paid to them when the neighborhoods were in decline, when the schools were in decline, when the crime rates went through the roofs. They only come in because there are those who are the promoters and the developers. And just within the last hour, Philadelphia leaders took part in the ceremony marking a multi-million dollar makeover in Center City. This is all the first phase of the East Market Redevelopment Project that focuses on a four-acre site from Market to Chestnut and from 11th to 12th Streets. High-end apartments above, restaurants, shops, and major retail stores below. The goal, connecting convention center commerce... We either come to us through government institutions or corporations. So they're the profiteers. The emphasis and the priority is going to be on profits. And the emphasis and priority for those in power will be what's going to make the most money. We'll create a development that will be a tipping point in the revitalization of North Broad Street and here in North Philadelphia. With street improvements and the additional developments to follow, North Broad will rival South Broad for vitality, creating the best urban street anywhere in the United States of America. You know, the thing about gentrification that makes it an issue more than anything else is the tendency for displacement of longtime residents. That's the reason why it's important. A lot of Philadelphia's frame of reference is the 1960s, in which there was a lot of displacement, some of it associated with uh, downtown development, a lot of it is associated with uh, university development, Temple and Penn. A public authority, a redevelopment authority, would use eminent domain to take a lot of property, both vacant and occupied, and would relocate people, displace people from their homes in order to convey larger tracts of land uh, to, for a public use, a government-related use, or an institutional use of some kind. People remember that, they remember relatives being displaced, and they're not happy, you know, about that experience. And that suspicion of government, the government process, and changing markets, real estate markets, and institutional plan, is, plans is very deep-seated. The folks who have needed that help, who've needed the resources, who have needed that attention, who can actually really benefit from a safe neighborhood, get pushed right out, and then get pushed out into a neighborhood exactly like the one that the gentrifying neighborhood has essentially replaced. But there was one component that we, we forgot to put in that book, we got the pretty little slick document, is what about the people that already live in these neighborhoods, right? 
got to pay some attention to those people. Tonight, investigators say someone started this row home fire on purpose in Philadelphia's Point Breeze section. That fire damaged several homes under construction in a gentrified neighborhood along South 20th Street. Broken windows and damaged homes in Kensington. But there's a message behind this crime. A sign left to the scene read, gentrification is death, revolt is life. You don't have to go far to see the changing landscape in many neighborhoods. NBC tends to be the wave of new developments into certain areas, certain neighborhoods of the city is striking up a lot of deja vu in other areas of the city, in neighborhoods full of people who never left. In other areas of the city where there is an investment happening or hasn't been investment happening, people are wondering what's going on. Uh, we never left. We never flee to the suburbs. Why aren't we getting investment in our neighborhoods? It tears families apart. And it also, like I said, very much affects the value that a family will have in their real estate. But when they come back and see how a community has transformed, then they realize what their family has lost. That's the inheritance. A lot of African Americans never inherit anything. Everything I am, I owe to the poor. Poor people made me who I am. You come to realize that the brick and the mortar is not the family, it's not the community. It's the intimate relationships you have with great grandparents like I had, grandparents like I had, mother and father like I had. Imagine what it's like to depend on living within four to six block radius, which many of these communities are. Everything you need more is there. Hospitals, fire departments, police departments, grocery stores, right? But more importantly, security, a sense of security, a sense of belonging, a sense of well-being. Almost every community wants that. A community is nothing more than the extension of a family. The loss of that, where do you take your child or your family, take your 12 children, and where do you go where you can get the same treatment, respect, honor, dignity, support. It's, it is disruptive. It is cultural violence at its best. When you force entire neighborhoods to move at a time, like you're, you're disrupting a lot of relationships. You know, if you live in the same neighborhood as, as an aunt or an uncle or several aunts and uncles, and you're short on rent for the month, you have a few people you can call on to, to make up for rent for that month. But if your aunts and uncles have all moved away, now you're short for the rent, and they're not nearby, and you've got to pay the rent today, you may get an eviction notice tomorrow. And what are you going to do? People are looking for self-determination and an equal voice, that the city is listening to voices that aren't big developers with big lawyers and big PowerPoint presentations and, and big uh, poster board that they can bring into city council meetings. People want to feel that they're listened to. I don't understand how the government just destroy people who work or try to do the best they can all their lives. And I thank God that we are still here with most of our right mind. There's a lot I can't remember, but it comes back. And that we do have our kids in our corner. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish it on nobody. The changes in the neighborhood have personally affected me and have affected many people I know. And that's something I'm interested in documenting. I mean, I think as a group, these paintings kind of tell that story over a period of time. My name's Jennifer Baker. I'm a painter and sculptor. Well, I've been doing paintings and monoprints of Northern Liberties over a period of about 30 years. I started actually doing paintings of this neighborhood um, 
in, I guess, late 80s, early 90s. The neighborhood was kind of burning down around us. All the businesses had closed and a lot of the homes were abandoned and a lot of the empty uh, industrial buildings were, were burning. I mean, they were, it was kind of arson by neglect. It just caught my attention. I felt like I wanted to make art about my surroundings, which I'd never done before. Well, I'm really interested in the history and the narrative and, and the change and what, you know, how that affects people. My paintings are very much about preserving memory of this neighborhood. The first group of immigrants that came to this neighborhood were from Germany. And then gradually that population turned over to um, immigrants from Eastern Europe. So then, there, then the next sort of the next wave of immigrants were from uh, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, from that area. So that painting there is St. Andrews, a Russian Orthodox church on Fifth Street. It's the size of a row house, it's tiny. And I decided to paint um, all the churches in the neighborhood because I felt like they were, each one represented a group of immigrants who came to this neighborhood and settled and built churches. My paintings, a lot of them are buildings, but they all have stories, you know, they have narratives. And they're really about the people that occupied those buildings. Those are really what the stories are about. I just started doing artwork about what I was seeing going on. I felt like it was dramatic, you know, visually dramatic, but also kind of something that was going to be past, that was going to be gone. So the last few years, you know, there's just been this really insane amount of development and it's gone so far to the opposite extreme. You know, the, the neighborhood was at, at that point in such disastrous condition that people thought any development is good development. Some developer is going to build 40 houses, they don't care about this old brick facade. It doesn't mean anything to them, they just want to make the most money they can. That's their job. But the people in the neighborhood who want to preserve that, it's, it's kind of, it's very hard to make that happen. I think it's been really a destructive way to develop the neighborhood. Um, so many of the old buildings have just been demolished because developers can make more money by just having a plot of land to build 50 houses, 50, you know, crappy, cheaply built houses that they can sell for, you know, a million dollars. Um, and that's a lot more profit than renovating an old industrial building into lofts or businesses or whatever. And because of that, also, there's a drastic shift in the population. People moving in are very wealthy. They have no history of the neighborhood. They have no idea of how their presence has changed the neighborhood. There was a lot of displacement in this neighborhood. Being here all this time, I know many, many artists who were forced out of this neighborhood because it was too expensive. I mean, change is inevitable, and you know, you hope a neighborhood that's really going downhill will be turned around and made better in some way. But the way it was done and the way it is still being done, I think is very destructive. I think it's important for people to have some past knowledge of their community. I think that's an important thing. Okay, thank you, Josephine. I don't necessarily feel that uh, painting all developers in that light, you know, driving people out is right. You know, I built a product that is tailored to a middle income clientele and I don't force anybody out. I don't like the negative connotation with that. You know, I always try to do the right thing and always try to build the right way. I have really good relationships with most people here. I think. The world is filled with divisive lines, you know, either you're this or you're that, or, you know, you're on our side or you're not. I'm Rahil Raza. I'm a real estate developer. I own Raza Properties, which is a real estate development company that focuses on the Philadelphia area. The middle income group continuously gets pushed out um, in the areas concentrated in Center City and University City, uh, Northern Liberties. 
there's really high priced housing uh, for, you know, directed towards high income individuals. Um, and not everyone can make that kind of money. Not everybody uh, has those type of jobs, you know. And I feel like I can uh, help that market uh, by pro providing housing, uh, high quality housing at an affordable rate and uh, do it in a profitable manner, but do it in an ethical manner as well. I make it a point to meet all the neighbors and uh, really get their opinion about everything. I think that a lot of uh, resentment comes in the fact where people um, don't communicate. So I try to communicate to everyone uh, that's going to be affected by the development. Be a voice for everyone. I hope that uh, this resentment and this clash, you know, changes sometime, or there's a better understanding between both sides. So. I understand uh, the public's sentiment. There have been some bad apples, but I know some really good developers as well. So. Up to the middle of the block, that's going to be six duplexes. Uh, a lot of councilmen uh, will highlight the negative aspects of development. And I think that there should be a broad approach to everything that a, a, gov a government does, a government body does. So a city's government should understand that there's all different markets in a city, right? And you can't pigeonhole one aspect because it doesn't uh, fit into another aspect. I think working alongside with the city, uh, I think that everybody has a, uh, a role, you know. Uh, I build middle income housing, they build uh, affordable housing or work, workforce housing or whatever they call it. And then there's developers that do high end housing, you know, it, everybody has a role. There's a market for everything, right? I think a good city government has a uh, broad model where they understand every aspect of development and they embrace it, you know. I feel like everything um, is better when people communicate, right? Just as our ancestors, the Lattimore's independence and civil rights are taken, help, meaning we need help. <laughs> we were out in front of my store with these signs right before they took our properties we were picketing in front of our stores business residents are not included in this development meaning the projects or the development of the uh, neighborhood. neighborhood it says section three of hud HUD's Act of 1968 states that we should be. And you can see it did no good. The ones that stayed made the place what it is, gave the place its soul, and, and that's what everyone else who's moving back into cities wants. They want a piece of that. You have gentrification all across the United States, from humongous cities to uh, smaller cities and towns. Uh, it's becoming a global part of capitalism. These are the types of solutions that will need to be pursued. But again, they all have to be pursued when somebody else says, well, that's going to make me less money. We have a lot of developers who are coming into the community, and we're asking them to be inclusive of us in the bounty. Like, what can we do together? What deals can we do together? Literally, deals that could be of value to all involved. You have infrastructure in Philadelphia. You have block captains and, and other kind of neighborhood level structures where you can bring people in. If they're not working, find another way to do it. Don't just pretend that if no one comes to a meeting, no one cares about what you're doing make every effort to include as many different voices as you can and make an even greater effort to include voices that have been historically ignored by policymakers in the past. 
And I hope that the, uh, the work we've done in the past can be used as some sort of a template or a model for communities not to just sit idly by and allow people to just run over them, but be willing to stand up and fight. And not to be able to get any help. We, we went everywhere. They had us running in circles. We wrote to everybody. Congressmen and everybody, oh God. Mayor Nutter told us, you better accept that money. You don't get anything. We trying to establish a livelihood. We trying to live. We need money to live. We ride the bus because we don't have a car. And we don't have a job, can't get a job. And lucky we've been blessed with our kids. I truly believe that it's somebody that can help us. And I know it's more than just us going through this. I know it is. Right to the day, I feel that I just have to keep fighting because I feel I owe my children and my grandchildren something.